Good evening and welcome to this webinar of the KNVTS, the Royal Dutch Association of Maritime Industry Engineers. And my name is Ruben and I am the event manager for KNVTS Amsterdam. Today we have an interesting speaker, but before that, some housekeeping announcements. Um, we are planning on having about 50 minutes to one hour of this webinar. And today the speaker has asked me, Christian Schouling has asked me to uh, take questions during his presentation. If you do not overload us with these questions, we will take them during his presentation. So you can write them down in the question uh, dashboard. I will read them to Christian, so I will interrupt him and I will read them and I will manage them a little so that we could take control of the time. Um, your microphones are muted and um, we look very much forward to this topic. And as I said, Christian Schouling is the uh, naval architect for Maridea and has a very broad experience in offshore construction vessels. Uh, he graduated, graduated in 2007 at the TU Delft in offshore engineering. And he has a very deep knowledge of hydromechanical and structural aspects of ships and offshore mooring systems. So today we're going to talk about the mass production of enabled design with the Mori base. And without further ado, I would now like to give the floor to Christian. Christian, please welcome. Hi, hello. Thank you. Let me share my presentation with you. Um, I'm pleased to, to, to be here this, uh, this evening and that everybody took the time uh, on this precious after evenings uh, to, to, to listen about what uh, I have to say about the uh, Moray base, which is a floating foundation that we have developed over the past one and a half year at Maridea for a uh, at least 15 megawatt um, wind turbine. And uh, let me browse you through it a little bit. Um, it, it looks a little bit odd to start with, so I'd like to, 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 to show, show you something about the philosophy of this whole design that was behind uh, the portfolio that is out there, uh, how we came to motions and, and uh, a mooring configuration that will suit uh, the, the, the regulation and the strict, strict calculations in the end. And finally, and most importantly, uh, we get to the uh, production process of the unit and why that is easier than uh, of other units, at least that's how we feel. I'm not sure who is in the audience right now. It could well be, of course, that there are a lot of competitors out there shouting already that uh, I'm mistaken at all sorts. Um, we feel this is a, 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 a good unit uh, for uh, mass production of uh, floating foundations. And uh, I will show them in, in the end uh, why so. And of course, also important, uh, it's not only about mass production, it's also about costs. So uh, what is a, uh, a, a good starting point for the capex of this unit of the uh, levelized costs of energy? And finally, a short wrap up. Let me uh, take you to the beginning of this uh, solution. Um, when I was at university about 20 years ago, it was more or less the beginning of offshore wind at all. And it was, of course, bottom fixed foundations. Fairly small turbines uh, based on monopiles and not all were successful. The time that I was at university, Horn Schreff Farm in Denmark was out there. And I think at a certain set period, only two out of 56 turbines were in operation because of some problems. Um, wind industry was not looking that good. And my professors were quite strong about it and say, yeah, of course, it's not working. Yeah? Let's say a short turbine, it's brought offshore, salt environment will certainly not work. And then 
last but not least, uh, we from the offshore, we have the experience. Uh, we know how to bring stuff offshore, and we'll do these guys. They put that on a monopile. They get all problems with the, with the concrete and the TPs and all the stuff. And that will surely not work, not to speak about the ships on legs that will install those turbines and ships on legs, a stupid idea. Well, that's more or less the, 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 the sound that I was hearing uh, back then around. And there were only a few, uh, for example, Jan van der Temple, who uh, started a fan club for the monopile to prove that monopiles were not such a bad idea after all. Um, and the, the, the offshore alternative that was promoted back then, at least by my professors, there were all the jackets. They were called in the offshore industry. Jackets were, were, were widely applied in, in, in the oil and gas. But today, of course, everybody knows that jackets are still not the most common solution. There are a few, and there are a few niche markets that they, wear, uh, that they are, are nice to, to, to operate with, but most of the foundations is monopile based. So about two years ago, we started wondering why, actually. Why were my professors wrong that time? And um, I think there are a few uh, topics that can be addressed. Um, jackets have stress concentrations and have therefore some issues with fatigue that have to be addressed. Of course, can be solved, but uh, have to be uh, uh, addressed. Um, and of course, jackets were always used as a deck carrier in the offshore industry. So when you're coming with a point load, such as a turbine mast, then uh, you have to split that load over three or four legs, which makes it immediately some kind of structural complex uh, introduction point. But maybe most important, uh, oil and gas jackets were never designed to be produced in series in a dedicated factory. And that's the biggest trick of the monopile. The uh, production of monopiles can be industrialized to a great extent. Meaning that costs will come down, even though monopiles are twice or three or sometimes even four times heavier than a jacket, they are still cost effective. And all the problems that my professors had in, in the first place had, these, these, these plate thickness get so thick, there's no yard that is able to handle that. Huh? There's no hammer available to hammer them into the soil. That proved all to be fairly scalable and is all solved nowadays. Hence, uh, monopiles are still uh, the most applied units. They are simple, they are robust, but most of all, they allow for mass production. In the development of the floating wind, which is currently picking up, um, there are a few concepts out there. Well, not a few. I think there, there are over 80 concepts currently out. And uh, looking at them, one got a feel that most of them are based on offshore technology. And um, the principle behind that is clear in the sense of experience. On the other hand, a lot of these offshore units uh, face the same problems or the same type of problems as jackets had. Some submersibles have a, a quite difficult production process or difficult in the sense of a shipyard. Eh, compare that to, to monopile production, uh, how, what, what type of complexity that is, and the difference between those still has the hard knuckles and the stress concentrations, still suited for a deck carrier and not necessarily integration of a point load. So that's also already something that has to be adapted and uh, can only be transported in, in one go in the end. So uh, there's only a limited number of ships available that is able to transport this large of semi submersibles Of course, there are also quite some, some, some spars out there. Uh, high wind is a, is a well-known uh, unit, already quite successful. Um, but they have an extreme draft for these the very large turbines that's unnecessary. And if you're not able to build them in, in Norway, uh, and maybe even if you are able in Norway, there is a possibly an upending process offshore that has to be faced and installation of the turbine at that same location, which is not that uh, handy to, to, to start with. Um, uh, a Tenselec platform is more or less a, some kind of semi-submersible, but it also have a complex mooring system. So over there, one get, can get a feel that offshore solutions that are presented are not that simple. And still, none of these solutions were ever intended for production in series in the dedicated factory. So we feel there was a niche for a, for a monopile type of floating foundation, which was simple and robust, but most of all, that was able for, for that enabled industrialized production. And 
if I take you a little bit uh, to the, the economics of the offshore floating wind, I'm not sure how familiar everybody is with that here. I, I took an economical outlook of DNV. There are multiple companies that have these type of uh, outlooks. Um, and, but you, you see here nowadays floating offshore wind is it's not that much. Uh, and um, about two megawatts is currently in development. It's starting, but still not, not that much. But in 2050, one expects about 250 gigawatts installed. Let's say that on average, those turbines are 20 megawatts in size, which of course, extremely large nowadays. The largest are currently 12 and a half, uh, 15 is, is approaching. So 20 is very large. Um, if you have uh, uh, then a, a 250 gigawatts that requires 12,500 units worldwide to be applied with an uh, average uh, life expectancy of 25 years, we're talking about 500 units to be installed each year. So that's more than one a day. Let's say a tremendous number of, of units that's out there. And, and then the question, of course, is a little bit why? Why is the potential floating wind then that huge? Well, clean energy is boosted at, uh, by, by governments currently. That's, that, that's certainly what's happening. Uh, but for floating wind, uh, we look to the North Sea, we look to the Irish Sea, and we see that shallow water locations get scarce. Maybe not now, but after 2030, almost all concessions are gone, meaning that all shallow water locations are, 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 are in use, and maybe not only by wind turbines, also by shipping and by fishing. Um, and there are also new markets that are starting up. Uh, you want to think of California and Japan, and those countries don't even have a a shallow sea nearby. So if they want to do something in offshore wind, that must be floating. Hence the reason for this uh, rapid speed up uh, after the year 2030. But there is a very important remark with this outlook. Um, this is only true if the levelized cost of energy and will be reduced. Uh, at the moment, floating offshore wind has a levelized cost of energy of, of, of of way over 150 euros per, uh, per, per megawatt hour. And um, we at least should bring that number down, one talks about about 60, um, to compete with other green alternatives. Otherwise, there is no sense of uh, starting a, a, a offshore development of such expenses, of course. So if we have to bring down these costs tremendously, um, we need to benefit of uh, mass production and the delivery in large numbers of units. But to do so, of course, we need a mass producible concept. And uh, mass producible concepts in wind turbines are already out there. Um, uh, wind turbines are produced in series. So the next step is to do production of the foundation also in series. And bringing that, all, summing that, that, bringing that all together, uh, we get to the design requirements that we put ourselves. So enabling mass production to start with, uh, we need to use and uh, rely on monopile building, monopile building efficiencies. And uh, we do that in a very optimized fabrication site. Uh, and of course the floater should be suitable for a standard turbine. If we have to develop our own turbine, it's quite likely not to, to enter in this, uh, or enter swiftly in this, and mass production, so we need to adapt to solutions that are already working and that are out there. Um, we want to do it everything robust and simple, so with, with as limited braces and, and joints as we can get, uh, reduce our welding, similar to, uh, to the, the monopole solutions, so we solve things with plate thickness rather than with uh, stiffening, and we require an easy integration of the turbine on the foundation, so not a floater suitable for a deck load, but suitable for a point load. And since we are thinking of a optimized fabrication uh, uh, facility, we must have a unit that is easily transportable to allow worldwide application. And easy transportable uh, is one thing, but also easy transportable in large numbers. So we should rely on a large fleet of transport vessels. So it should be suitable for uh, more than the, 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 uh, the few semi-submersible sets for some submersible transport vessels that are out there. So having that all then uh, in mind, you get something which is sh shaped like a monopile, like a, a, a bended continuous pipe maybe. It starts to look like an eel or a snake in your head, hence the name moray base that we have 
contained. Uh, it's a very large eel, and the Moray eels are about the largest eels one can find on the planet. So it's not related to whiskey. It's uh, it's not related to a nice village in Scotland. It's related to this eel. We have uh, considered many alternatives. Uh, and I've listed here a, a, a few. Um, we ended somewhere in the, we started somewhere in the, in, in the, the upper left corner, we ended somewhere in the bottom right. And there's something going wrong. Yes. Um, in the discussion with various clients, we already opted for, for various configurations, two turbine sizes, a smaller one, a 10 megawatt, to make our, our concept more comparable to the, uh, to the competition, and a larger one, a 50 megawatt. And we did it in high waves and medium waves and in uh, various outfitting levels. One to be very robust, uh, meaning that it simply accepts the uh, thrust overturning moments of the turbine, and by its sheer size, it limits its inclination angle. And the other one with a uh, ballast system that is always live and that compensates for this uh, thrust moment. And from our offshore perspective, uh, we have always been in favor for this passive solution with the differences in uh, lightweight sizes, as you can see here in this table, uh, are uh, tremendous, making it likely more attractive to, well, to, to start with the, the, the active solution. One can imagine that uh, for the difference in weight that you see over here, uh, one can build a very redundant ballast system, of course. Um, having, in the end, also uh, the uh, uh, medium wave uh, active unit developed for 9.5 megawatt turbine, which is more or less comparable to some semi submersibles that are out there at the moment, um, compared that to the published uh, values, it appeared that our solution in the end was even not that heavy, um, which might be a little bit unexpected uh, because we are based on a, a, a monopole, right? So that's based on, on large uh, shell thickness. How can that then be, uh, so how can that save that much weight? We come to that later. Um, but this is more or less the, the corner where we, we started our development and we also tested one unit at, uh, at Marin and that was the, the largest one of all. Um, but this is the most uh, attractive solution, not a passive one, but an active unit, which is uh, quite uh, uh, lighter, huh? as you can see over here, it's also smaller in size. Uh, I have listed here the, uh, the, uh, the main dimensions. Um, and then this whole exercise, these various configurations, uh, it's a, it, we, we, did, we did the study quite thoroughly right now, and let's all get the idea that this concept is quite a generic. It's quite easily scaled, and uh, the scantlings can then be uh, optimized for the further locations. And in this active configuration, to give you an idea, the, the, the thrust of the uh, turbine is about 2.8 meganewtons, resulting in a thrust moment of about 400 meganewton meter. But since the ballast lever is a large this type of unit, so we shifting ballast from from one column 84 meters to the other one, you have to shift about 600 tons of water uh, to compensate for this uh, overturning moment or giving a displacement of uh, 24,000 tons. The 600 tons, of course, is, is, is almost nothing. So that's a, a fairly uh, small system. It has to be reliable and to be redundant, but compared to the size of this unit, it's not that much. I'd like to show you a, a, a short movie of the model tests that we did at Magen. Um This is uh, the, uh, uh, an AC state of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, 10 meters, and uh, the highest wave that's coming along and it's hitting the, uh, the unit uh, is about 18 meters high, and this is also the worst uh, wave having that you could find. But of course, most important for us is that the motion results that we got out of this uh, tests uh, were, uh, were slightly better than we numerically predicted up front. So from an engineering perspective, uh, we were on the safe side. Um, here I scaled down uh, the time 
to make the motions uh, in, in real time, so to say. And here you see that the, the, the accelerations in the nozzle over here are fairly low, about two meters per second squared in extremes in the horizontal plane, and vertically it's even less. So there's also not uh, that much of an acceleration. And you also see that during this survival storm, uh, there is uh, hardly any dynamic uh, inclination. It's also fairly limited. It's, it's very comparable, for example, to what a high wind is suffering nowadays. So that gives us a, a strong uh, impression that a standard turbine can indeed be <coughs> applied. What we also con, uh, could see here when the slam was hitting uh, the um, uh, slam was hitting uh, the deck tube is that there was no uh, severe aspiration occurring on this unit. So actually, uh, although it looked quite spectacular, the, uh, the cylindrical shape of this unit makes the slam more or less gradual. So uh, that is helping a lot in the reduction of the, uh, the aspiration levels. Of course, our ultimate goal of all these calculations was to define internal forces so that we could um, and get scantlings of this, this unit and get an appropriate uh, lightweight calculation. And to do so, we also had to design a mooring system. If you see a unit like this with a more or less sh sh uh, shaped like a, a bended, open bended paperclip, then likely a, a mooring line might even twist uh, a column uh, or a, put a, a torsion load on a column. So we have to make sure that the mooring system was realistic and suitable. <coughs> so we designed a mooring system for shallow waters, uh, where for shallow water, say 200 meters, so that is far deeper than you can currently do with bottom fixed wind. But uh, say this is this North Sea condition. And uh, although we, we intended to start with a catenary type of unit uh, with an offer perspective, simple, easy, simply chain, uh, it already felt that the, the uh, catenary had to be that heavy uh, to prevent the thrust force from lifting the full chain from the seafloor. So that's what we that, that, that's our, our issue here. Uh, if you have a, a catenary shape and you put the thrust force on, then, then there's hardly any catenary shape left, hence no springing system of the catenary left. So there are two ways to, to solve that. You can have an extreme heavy catenary with very heavy chain or, or beads on it. That's something that is done, for example, in the Kinker Dime field of Scotland. But uh, in, uh, in, in consultancy with uh, uh, a, a road manufacturer, uh, we went to a taut mooring system where there is a stretcher of about 100 meters uh, to allow for axial strain in this taut uh, mooring line. The chains uh, are still left on the, on the seafloor for the, uh, the interaction with the soil and we still deal with conventional anchors. And having only a three-point mooring system will require only a single chain stopper that, that, that can be applied and that's all uh, standard equipment. Um, of course, we also checked the, uh, the displacements to make sure that that was more or less realistic. Uh, one of the important things is, and that's also something that's happening, helping with this taut mooring system, is that your footprint, your dynamic footprint is reducing in size. Uh, that export cable still needs to go to the, to the seabed. Uh, in some cases, uh, you need space to have a, a, a lazy wave uh, or, or lazy S configuration, uh, get that cable to the, to, to the seafloor. And it is difficult to have a very large footprint in that cable without twisting the cable too much. So having a taut mooring system, reducing the dynamic footprint uh, is already helping solve that problem. Uh, we also saw that uh, with this type of system, we can have a footprint of the mooring system, which is about seven times the rotor diameter. And seven times the rotor diameter comes pretty close to the aerodynamic efficiency of spacing of these floating units all together in a wind farm. So that's pretty attractive, then the mooring system need not to overlap uh, the mooring system of the neighboring uh, turbine. As you can see here, we have also uh, uh, given some specification to the mooring equipment required, uh, concluding that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's large pieces of equipment, but it's equipment that is out there, it's equipment that has been used already. And of course, that total mooring line was also included in the model test. 
coming here a little bit into the internals of the unit, I plotted here a, uh, a, a smaller uh, Moray base. Um, we adhere to the uh, uh, DMV regulations and the DMV uh, standards. And of course, in the end, blazing thickness will be optimized a little bit with the, uh, with the production uh, facility to make that uh, to make it more easy for them. But gives here an, an idea. And you already see what kind of plate thicknesses we are we are feeling here in the in the floater. We are about uh, uh, 34, 36 mil, and in the most loaded elbows, we get up to 40 millimeter of plating, which is of course a significant plate thickness for a shipyard. But for a monopile factory, they start at 40. So, uh, as such, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Moray base is feasible. And what you can also see is that we have applied uh, internal stiffener rings. Um, the uh, internal stiffeners uh, are easily implemented in this monopile production process. There are still no crosses of longitudinals together with this web frames, which is always a, a hard point in the, uh, in, in the uh, structural behavior of the unit and is always difficult to manufacture. So that's something that's all left out. And you see also some bulkheads that are required to have some kind of uh, ballast division inside to make uh, ballasting operations during the installation. And it is a, as an active unit. I compensate for the trust moment uh, and assist. Um, there were, of course, significant calculations done. Uh, we did it uh, in diffraction uh, analysis. We did it in Morrison time domain to obtain appropriate load sets and dominant load sets, which you can end up in a fair model to check if our scandalings were chosen uh, correctly. Uh, that model included then the wind turbine, it included the mooring system. And since the uh, dominant load case is actually during storm conditions due to its own inertia, uh, we also needed a very detailed mass distribution to get it uh, inside and to make sure that all the uh, inertia forces were contributed correctly in our, uh, in our calculations. So, that's something about the uh, unit uh, and about the, uh, uh, the attractiveness from a, a wind turbine perspective and from the uh, uh, motions and structure. But let's now get a, a little bit detailed into the uh, hull production process. We rely as much to um, the, uh, put it out. We rely as much on the monopole production process as possible. So uh, we do that and we deviate from that a little bit because of the presence of that ring frame. We can already see here that ring frame that is present in the monopile. Currently, monopiles don't have ring, uh, ring frames, which makes sense if you hammer something into the soil. That's such a ring frame is, of course, uh, surely in the way of uh, a nicely soil, a nicely penetration of the soil. But that's, of course, in our case, not that much of an issue. So if you would have a, a can, which is more length, uh, of, the, of the length of a, a practical bit of plating that you can get, say three meters, um, and you put a ring in, you have something to build your can on, and uh, you need sufficient stiffness in your can to have it lined up in a process like this. And that's the whole reason why uh, a common monopile has a thickness of about uh, 120th of its diameter. And that means that in our, our calculations and, and, and our results, if you started to be a monopile, this should have been about 120 mil to start with, if, the, if this were a monopile with a large diameter of 15 meters. In our case, that can need only be 60. So there we save about half of the weight compared to traditional monopile production, and we don't get that much of a welding uh, in return for that. So um, lining up these cans with this internal ring uh, will still enable a production process like this that saves about half of the steel. So that is working well. Um, we also checked the, uh, the deformation of these, uh, these cans that's all uh, resultable. And uh, the deformation of these scans with ring is even less 
than of current uh, monopole production. So there is no reason why this type of production would not work. Then of course the tricky thing is the elbow. Um, as you can see over here, and the elbow is built up out of a single curve plating as well. There are small knuckles in here, so to speak. This is some kind of a lobster bag rather than a double curve plating. So that can also be produced out of cans. And uh, who knows what is possible in uh, uh, if this gets to a higher level in terms of manufacturing. If we can do this in 3D printing, that would make it even more attractive. Um, coming back to our own production unit, uh, in passive configuration, we have a, a, a unit for 15 megawatts with a diameter of 15 meter. That's currently not producible in uh, monopole factories. They reach up to 12 meter, which nicely suits our active configuration, which was uh, just a lot smaller. So that even makes that this, this unit is already suitable for current production facilities and does not necessarily require a full new factory to start with. Um, this is the production of the, of the main steel section. But of course, we have to assemble this whole unit to the, to the floating unit in itself. Um, our dedicated production facility will produce uh, the, the Juro sections and the elbows, as just explained, and assemble them in three main sections. These are the three main sections that you are aiming for. So that is the uh, uh, column number three and the uh, transition piece. That's the uh, floater part, deck, and the freestanding column with the heave blade. Um, then uh, it will deliver these three pieces on its key site. And from there, it will transport it to a uh, a assembly harbor, which is far more close to project location. Remember, we have a dedicated production facility, which could be in, in Far East or in East Asia. Well, this unit has to be uh, activated in Japan or in California. Um, so we have to transport still half the world with this, uh, these units, and we have dedicated facilities. So we don't have 20 dedicated facilities uh, out there. We have only a few. Um, these units, the, the, these main sections are heavy, um, but 3,000 tons is not heavy for a ship in itself. It's the, if it was all welded together, then it was a difficult thing to, to handle. Then there's only a few transportation vessels out there that can do that. But if it's still in this limited sizes, there is a far larger fleet of transport vessels that you can rely on. One could even think of common general cargo vessels that are able to handle these type of sections. And as such, we can rely on a far larger fleet of transport vessels and not only uh, have a unit that is suitable for mass production, but there is also then mass transport available. You need, of course, to scale up all the elements in the, in the chain to make sure that we can get to that fabulous number of over one unit per day installed. Um, so we bring this to our uh, assembly harbor. And there we have, of course, more or less the same problem. There uh, we have to install a, a farm of, uh, well, currently a large farm is, uh, is, is 50 wind turbines. I think of 150 turbines. We have to install them in one season. So we need series assembly to make that happen. And um, we select there for the method to do that uh, float. And I will go and uh, dive into that uh, uh, a little deeper afterwards. Um, but to do that float, the most important thing is, you, for example, you would rely on the dry dock to do this assembly process. You have a severe bottleneck in your system. Not only are there only limited dry docks available in the world that are able to handle these type of size of units, but uh, still these units are these dry docks are very expensive, and you have still a, a very uh, hard point in your planning where the dock is flooded and the units should get out and new units should get in. Um, so we do assembly, therefore float. Uh, we commission our floater also inshore. We do that in the assembly harbor. We install our turbine inshore. The assembly harbor, which is like most float units, except for spar types. And we can do also our uh, commissioning inshore. And when the whole unit is uh, cleared, 
and uh, proven to be uh, operable, uh, we can tow it out and hook it finally up in the farm. Now, one might think, is it so handy to assemble such a thing afloat? That is more and more practical to have units standing on a solid floor and uh, to weld them there together. But we have to, to keep in mind the size of these type of units and the clearances that are there. So to, to, to get a unit like this stable on a floor, you need to build construction towers of, of 40 meters high, uh, enable each to carry 1,500 tons to make sure that you can, can handle that deck tube. Um, and on the other hand, there is a lot of experience within the offshore industry with large units and float overs at open seas. And well, compared to that, our assembly process is fairly easy. We do that in a harbor that's a sheltered area. Uh, we have units that are, are, are stably floating on itself. Uh, and this is also nice, which is illustrated by this picture over here. If this jagging tower uh, was to lower into these two uh, other elements uh, here on the, on the floater that's stabilized with a, a few uh, hoisting bags, that if there was a small mis misalignment in the ballasting or trimming of something, then uh, this unit will, uh, can, be, can be pushed into shape by the guides and we are then later fixated. And the next step is then done over here. So it's inherently tolerant for misalignment. If you have to make this happen on a solid dock floor, that's far more difficult to to, to, to maintain. <coughs> of course, now everything is on the water, so there is no easy way to do the welding process. But on the other hand, we have a, uh, a serious production process. So we can easily afford to build these reusable circular bridges that are hung onto the foundation to, to, uh, foundation to make sure that we can have a, a dedicated and, and high quality welding process. And what's also nice, of course, for things that are floating, it's fairly easily scalable. A larger barge means a larger carrying capacity. Here, there is a, a solution with four jacking towers. It can be eight jacking towers if the, the, the size of this unit increases, which is far more difficult with cranes. Cranes have, at some point, there is a, 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 a lack of equipment to make, that, to make that happen. Here, we rely on smaller elements that are easier put in series and as such, are easily uh, scalable. And because we avoid uh, uh, some very large lifts, there is also uh, less bottleneck in craning operations in the units. And everybody in the offshore industry knows that the crane is always the bottleneck in a swift installation process. So um, if we have alternatives and can rely mostly on the roll-on, roll-offs and, and a large fleet of SPMTs to make things happen, then there's also space for an SPMT that's breaking down. And as such, we feel that having a, 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 a floating uh, installation process, uh, relying on that inherently, uh, that we are inherently tolerant for misalignment, but also that we are inherently mobile. We have here an installation uh, position of uh, the barge, the, the mating barge over these two units. As soon as this is lowered down and uh, the guides are fixated, there's no need that this floating unit should stay here. It simply is floated to a uh, a quieter part of the harbor where the welding can be done and the next one can be assembled. It's all um, uh, inherently mobile of itself because it is floating. And uh, also nice here to see there are no uh, tile differences anymore. So misalignment device that is also helping. Yeah, all these harbors are, are, for example, in Eemshaven here in, in Holland, we have a tile difference of four meter. Here, everything is floating in the same basin of water, no matter if that is fluctuating, yes or no. So that is, that is helping a lot. So from the production process, um, what's then the benefit in uh, economical value? Um, with the concept as we have it right now, uh, we went to... Uh, uh, to yards and to vendors, uh, we got quotes so that we have something uh, that we can, can found our price prediction on. And we uh, compared ourselves to uh, uh, the competition. Um, of course, 
uh, it's now all based on the same assumptions. And I'm quite sure that if there's now a designer in the audience saying, hey, I have a semi submersible, I can do it for half. Um, I, I understand, but what we want to do is to compare and have the same underlying arguments in all of these calculations. So please see these prices related to each other. Um, what we then see is that the Moiré base in itself can reduce the capex of the support of a floating foundation between the 25 and the 40 percent, dependent of the layout that you are and the configuration that you are aiming for, which of course is a, a, a significant number. What does that do to the levelized costs of energy? Um, well, maybe not as much as we want it to be. Eh? We want to go to about 60 euros per megawatt hour. Uh, we are able to get it down to about 74 euros per megawatt hour, which of course already uh, uh, a, a significant reduction to uh, the others that is out there. And it's getting close to 60 megawatt uh, uh, euro per megawatt hour, but we still need some, some increasing efficiency in the other elements of the, of, the, of the chain. And that might be slightly difficult to realize. For example, the turbine in itself is already 40% of the total investment for a wind farm. I'm not sure if, if, if a, a turbine manufacturer can cut still 25% of its costs. Um, and the same goes for, for anchor chain. If you, the, the anchor chains are out there, they will not save half of the cost in chain anymore. The chains are, are, are produced in a, already in an uh, uh, industrialized manner. Maybe there are some, some gains out there. Um, if we do our we build up experience, uh, we can reduce equipment size. That might help. Um, I know that there are already steps made in electrical distribution. There are some, some guys out there that are trying to make far cheaper cables, for example. That is helping. Um, but that gives them the feel that there is, from the 74 euros per megawatt hour, we can get down to the value of about 60, which is a necessity to make sure that that large potential of 250 kilowatts in, in 2050, so the number of about one unit per day delivered, that can then be maintained. And as such, the, the, the Moray base is a, uh, a, a significant contribution in this reduction of uh, the levelized cost of energy and getting the uh, floating wind started. So, to summarize, um, we have the strong belief that the Moray base is, uh, is a simple and a structural concept. It's robust in its shape. And thanks to its shape, we have limited stress concentrations, which is all helping to simplify the structural concept of this unit. As shown uh, just now, we are fairly capex friendly uh, related to the, to, to the competition, but also uh, because we are relying on the monopile production process. We avoid typical bottlenecks, such as dry docks, which are fairly expensive. Um, because we transport the unit not in, a, in one go, but in three sections, we are uh, easier globally transportable. And we have even proven that we can be lighter than uh, competing designs, which might not be uh, expected in the first place. And last but not least, uh, our unit relying on the monopole production process is uh, ready for mass production and we are suitable for standard wind turbine. And, and therefore, we open the door to the target level at cost energy of about 60 euros per megawatt hour. And uh, that means that Mora Bay is ready for the future. So thank you for your attention. And I'm um, very happy to answer uh, almost any question that you might have. Thank you, Christian. Um, yes, we have questions. Uh, they slowly started trickling in. And the first one I think Thought you might have addressed it um, and the question is from Alexander is what is the water depth limit for the moored solution you spoke about 200 meters and the shallow version but uh, what is the water depth limit um, well offshore solutions are, are, are moored in a tremendous uh, water depth, so I don't think that the, the, the water depth as such is limited by the mooring system. The mooring system, of course, gets far more expensive 
when uh, the water depth increases. So it's get more and more a, an economical solution. There needs, for example, also to be a uh, electrical cable to go to out there. That's also a very expensive thing. So uh, I think at the moment uh, we are looking at a water depth to up to 200 meters, and that is mainly because uh, everybody expects that the North Sea is the first market to kick off, and mainly Scotland. And then we're talking about water depths up to about 200 meters. So that's to, to, to start with. But uh, I, I don't see a, a practical limit related on the boring system as such for that 200 meters. Okay. Then a question from Ton Bos is uh, the transport to the site done by towing or uh, HLF, so a heavy lifting vessel? Yes. Um, no, I would certainly consider a, a, a simple a simple tugboat to do so. A, a, um, a submersible heavy lift vessel would put requirements on my assembly harbor. You already saw that with the uh, huge, uh, with, with, the, with the floaters for the Kinkardine farm that are offered Aberdeen. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but those are, are, are quite large semi-submersibles built in Spain, loaded on a a uh, submersible vessel, the, the, the fjord, <coughs> if I were uh, correct. And um, they needed to be discharged somewhere. But there was, although the field was pretty close to Aberdeen, there was no shallow of sheltered water in uh, Aberdeen uh, deep enough so these vessels could dive and discharge. So they had to do that on the Maasvlakte and have a tugboat anyway for the, the, the final tow along uh, the full English island. So. Um, what we want to do is that we don't want to rely on the few harbors that are able uh, to accommodate a dive of, of, of 20, 24 meters deep. We want to be able to do this in more in, in more standard harbors that are, are more readily available. For example, Eemsenhaven. Uh, we, we have that to stick to about 9, 10 meters of water depth. So there's no possibility for this uh, heavy transport vessel to, to dive and, and get it on its back. So that's the uh, uh, the philosophy why we want to rely on tugboats. And there's also from Ton is a question of, about uh, towing. Is uh, has the the behavior of towing been evaluated and the uh, the bullet pull uh, requirement? Not yet. The honest answer is not yet. But okay. uh, given this this type of unit, we do not consider that uh, a a uh, significant issue for now. Of course, that will be addressed, that's for sure. Okay. Then from, I think, Thanusha, uh, the question, did you have to design a dedicated grillage and sea fastening for these sections? Um, we didn't do that. And uh, hopefully we don't have that much to do so. Uh, uh, we, 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 it's, it's a standard tube. Uh, what we expect, so uh, as such, we, we also think that the, the transport is, is, is fairly easy. Of course, there shall be a grillage and a sea fastening on, 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 on ships like that, but we didn't go that far yet. Okay. And then a question uh, is, uh, is there an adaptation of the mooring system to a specific site or is that automated? Yeah. No. Mooring systems are very site-specific. Um, so uh, we expect to, to design a mooring system for uh, every farm, so to speak. Uh, hopefully not for every turbine in the farm, but for every farm location. Uh, having a, a farm uh, in the center of the North Sea or a farm pretty close to the uh, Scottish coast, uh, that's a totally different uh, sea environment and, and water depth and, and soil and anchor type that you can use. So uh, that is something that will be redesigned every time, unfortunately. But the floater in itself is set. Okay, so that will answer, I think answers uh, one of the next questions it was, is it, um, are there any modifications also driven by client requirements? Or for example, if you consider very deep waters in Brazil, um, would that have an uh, impact on your design? No, I don't think so. But we have spoken to a few clients already, and 
they made the move from a passive configuration, which was our initial starting point, uh, have it simple, have it robust shear by size. And they said, well, this is getting so big. Um, we prefer if you add that active ballast system and it uses size in it. So um, we, we are open to client comments, so to speak. Okay. Uh, I have a question here from Automatus. Um, I have to read it. It's quite long. Is the fairly chain stopper always located at the top of the deck? There is no chain stopper. Okay. What we aim for is a three-point mooring system. And of course, that's that's point of discussion at the moment still within the, the whole industry. Everybody is aiming for a three-point mooring system because with a three-point mooring system, you only need a single tensioner uh, to, to, to uh, uh, tension your whole system equally. And the tensioner can be submerged. So that's on the seabed. Meaning that uh, uh, the, the, the fair lead is a, a simple pad eye uh, where the chain, or in our case, likely a stretcher is to be connected. And that's it. So there is no equipment uh, on the unit itself. The, the only piece of equipment that is there is the, uh, the, the tensioner on the seafloor. And for example, Vrijhoff has very nice solutions uh, to, to enable that. Okay. Because the same person had uh, the question if the mooring system showed 137 millimeter top chain section but holding a capacity of 19,000 kilonewtons. And the question is what is the chain grade? Phew. Uh, that, 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 that's something for the anchor manual of Freyhoff, honestly. Okay. <laughs> it's not the, the it is not the, the the highest that you can get. It's it's, it's somewhere better than mid grade. Can, can I say it like that? Okay. Uh, there's also questions about the accessibility of the uh, of the system. Is um, yeah. Um, is there a problem with the fair lead above waterline for worker access, or or how are boat landings done? Am I still sharing my screen? Yes. I see that in this picture, it's not as clear as I would want it to be. There are two boat landings foreseen. There is one boat landing on column number three, <coughs> which will also provide access to the turbine itself. So that's a boat landing that's quite often used almost only for accessing of this, this turbine. Another boat landing is on column number one, and there is here a external pathway uh, alongside of the, of the moray base that might likely in the end shift over the top. Um, and that, uh, those uh, boat landings and that uh, corridor will provide access to the mooring platforms, which you can see one over here and one over there. And you might inspect certainly uh, the first uh, units and in the, during the first years inspect these, these mooring ports. So that's the way that there are uh, uh, provided access. There is no uh, personnel tunnel, for example, through this floater. That's not accessible. So you have to do that by boat and preferably over the outside so that you don't have problems with internal ventilations and, and, and stuff. We don't expect that this, these inspections are uh, uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, hopefully they are the first only on a, on a uh, six month basis or afterwards a year or two year basis that there need to be people on this unit. So if you have to access the interior over here, there's all kinds of funding requirements for safe working. So we'd like to avoid that. Hence, we do everything from the, from the external. Over here, it's a little bit more complex, but that is also providing access to the turbine in itself. Okay. I hope that ends so the question. Yes, the question is okay, keeping going. I also wanted to add, um, yes. although not started with, having this mooring points above water is helping you with, uh, of course, the, the, the maintenance and the inspection of that, uh, uh, of that uh, attachment point. But um, when maximum load is by uh, wind thrust, so over here, that, that thrust is compensated by the mooring force over here. So by adding your, having your mooring points higher up, uh, ending up above water, you are reducing the maximum lever of the maximum thrust and such limiting the 
trust mode. So it's helping you also from a design perspective if you bring these units up. Yeah, because that was a question from Florin Golea is the uh, what would be the approximate mooring tension load during operational conditions. So um, I think you were kind of explaining that now. Um, yes. Um, honestly, I don't know from the top of my head. Um, but I know Florin, I will get in touch with him. Okay. And he also asked the question, how will you connect the umbilical uh, to the, the wind turbine? So the power cable. The power cable. Um, in this picture, you can see here this yellow tube, with, which is some kind of a J tube, uh, where you can pull in that uh, connecting cable. And you really will see the, the problem because you have to put here some kind of wave shape inside the unit to make that to make that happen so uh, that's how, how we do it so it's, it's it's pulled in here through the through the j and okay. that's external not internal external uh eric bogles is asking you mentioned tlps have a complex mooring system um have you considered comparing the cost of a tlp mooring system with your system in relation to the motion behavior of the turbine? So, um, meaning that uh, on a TLP, uh, we expect less motions than on the free floating system, such as we propose, I guess. Uh, and we should benefit from that limited motion, right? Um, no, I did not do that. Um, that's something for uh, that. That could be. It could, that could be interesting for further study. I'm. I'm not sure how much is to be gained uh, in the in the turbine in itself, uh, because the, the the turbine manufacturers provide more or less standard products. So I don't think they will uh, scale their equipment down if you are able to 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 have less motions. And I also slightly doubt if that will be true in the end of these uh, steel piece. Still, there is there's stain in the mooring system. There is some there are some rotations happening. We, we even see that at the current monopiles that there is motions in the turbine in itself, uh, although the foundation was as stable as you can get it. So, uh, but that's my gut feeling. But the short answer, no, we didn't look at that. And then uh, the last question, and uh, as we are already uh, over our time, is uh, from Erwin van der Berg. And uh, can you tell a bit more about the necessity of this heavy plate at the end of the Moray base? The heavy plate at the end of the Moray base? Yes, there it is. I guess that's what he means, yes. That's I yeah. Um, yeah, we did a lot of motion calculations on this unit, and um, the initial the initial design, this one, didn't feature a D flat, and um, this unit suffered from a severe coupling between pitch and heave. Well, it's dependent on what axis, of course, you're looking at, but uh, the the the, the, we see the, the, the center line of the unit and on the, over the, the axis where the unit is symmetric in a, from a hydrostatic point of view. So uh, we start with the center line over here and then through the middle of the float. So that's our, our center line. And then heave and pitch have a very bad coupling. And that is due to the fact that the center of gravity of this whole unit is, of course, quite close to the location of this floater. There is where most of the uh, displacement is concentrated, hence there's the most mass, must be the most mass. Um, but uh, the a unit rolls and pitch naturally, either aesthetically, around its center of flotation, which is actually the center of gravity of the waterline area, which is of these three units is, is equal, uh, these three areas are equal, so you're ending up somewhere here, one third in the equaler triangular. And there is a lever between these two points, meaning that as soon as you start to uh, heave, then the unit, uh, if you go one meter up, 
we're having more displacement deviating over here than at that column, hence it must also pitch. By adding this heave plate, not only we are adding simply displacement to that far column, we're also adding a lot of hydromechanic mass over there. So dynamically, the center of gravity is rapidly shifting to the uh, freestanding column, and as such, diminishing the lever between the center of gravity and uh, the center of uh, flotation, and therefore uh, diminishing greatly the coupling. There's still some coupling, but it's fairly limited between uh, pitch and heave. So that's the reason why there is that big sheave at the end of column number one. Okay. Well, Christian, thank you very much for uh, this very interesting uh, webinar uh, we had today. Uh, we had a very uh, attentive audience, a lot of interesting questions, and um, I'm not sure if you are a Khan VTS member yet, but if not, then uh, we offer you a, a year of free membership uh, as a thank you gift to uh, this webinar. And um, our next webinar will be announced soon. Um, we don't have the firm date yet, but we will announce it on our social media. And uh, again, I want to thank everybody who attended to be online here on this uh, slightly stormy uh, evening. So um, the weather was uh, well in, in sync with the, uh, the topic. And uh, Christian Schauling, thank you very much for uh, your speech today and the interesting topic and I want uh, to say thank you and to all the audience see you next time and to the people behind the screens who made this possible Marianne especially thank you very much for your support and uh, we hope to have you online again on our next webinar to be announced very soon Christian thank you good evening and goodbye